Okay, running. Hi everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Today is the session where we work together on the Teach Cluster and we get our hands dirty working with BWA and Salman mostly. So the first thing that I'd like to, uh, to show to you is really how to use Linux. And I've posted a video that really explains the basics of Linux, but I'd still like to take a couple of minutes to re-explain everything here in case you're not familiar yet with these command line interface type of interacting with your computer. So I find that the best system to understand this is Macintosh because Macintosh is actually a dual system. You've got what is called a finder here, and I'm sure everybody's used to that. It's called Windows if you've got a Windows computer. And it also comes natively with a Linux. It's not really a Linux, it's called Unix, but it doesn't really matter. The difference is almost none. So everything that's true for Linux is also true for the terminal here that you have on Mac. So the way to open that terminal if you have a Mac is something that I explained to connect to the Teach cluster, but that's that's an app that's here. And if you just click on it, then you get that. So the point I want to make with um, uh, with this is that this here, what I'm typing now, this command line interface is Linux. And that's just the a representation of what is here in the finder. And to demonstrate this, I'm here starting a terminal and you can see that it says biod25 here, biod25. And that's the place, that's what is called a folder in, in the finder. It's actually that folder. So the first command that we'll use sometimes is pwd for present working directory. And that gives me a path here that's called users gfilion work teaching biod25. And you can see it as a tree like that's really the representation everything starts with users and then it's as if i double clicked on users then double click on gfilion that's my home on my mac then double click on work then double click on teaching and then i'm finally here in this directory here this folder that's called bld25 so it's one and the same thing okay i can either see it from my linux window or i can think of it as this window here in the finder so the second command that's quite useful is ls for list and it tells me that inside the 25 there is something that's called folder and something that's called file.txt and you can see that indeed that is what I can see with the other representation. So the command ls is quite useful to see what's inside a directory. There is this notion of working directory uh, that was brought up by PWD, present working directory. So it's the same thing as when I open folder by double clicking on it I am now in folder and whatever I do is inside that folder. It's no longer in value 25. So the equivalent of double clicking on Linux is CD for change directory. And if I say CD folder, you can see that value 25 here changes with folder. If I ask the present working directory, it's the same path as before, but now folder has been added. And if I do LS for list, you can see that it contains another file, which is that one here okay so basically just seeing the content of the directory is ls and you don't need to do anything when you're oh, uh, when you're on on windows or on the finder because that appears all the time and to see the content in linux you need to say ls now on my mac if i want to go back to to the folder bio 25 i would click here okay and i'm back to where i was before so the equivalent of this in Linux is cd and then dot dot. So this dot dot here brings me back to body 25 So that here stands for the parent directory, which means remove one entry from this path here. Bring me back to the one that was just before. And so now I'm, I'm presently in this working directory. You can see that indeed the content of the directory is what is shown here on the left. Another command that's quite useful is copy. So here, you know, on my Mac, I can do this and then ask for a copy. And on Linux, the way we do this is cp. And I can do, for example, cp file.txt. And then where do I want to copy it? In folder. And I'm going to open folder here. And as soon as I press enter, you can see that the file has appeared. So it's just to emphasize that this is really the same thing. Mac Linux is not another thing that runs in, you know, it's not another system inside my Mac. It's the same system. I can either view it 
as this command line interface here, or I can view it as a click and icon type of system, it, but it's the same system in the background. So I made a copy of file.txt, I'm pretty happy about it. And now uh, what I can do is go again in folder. You can see that I have another file in file.txt. And if I want to see the content of file.txt, there is this really nifty application which is called less, L-E-S-S, -S, the opposite of more. And then I say file.txt. I press enter and then I got the content. This is the content of the file. If you open it with less, press Q to exit. So that's really, if I double click on it, you can see that the representation is, is really is correct. That's really what's inside. But it says file.txt and just to tell me that there's nothing after that. There are no empty spaces here. And as it says, if I want to exit that, I just press Q on my keyboard and I'm back here. So that's about it. That's what I wanted to show you about how to use Linux. That's pretty much all we need to use today. So let's get started with the session proper. So in principle, uh, you guys are already connected on your session. And if you haven't done so, then uh, you can do this right now. I'm going to connect on the Teach cluster. So that's SSH for Secure Shell, LCL, U, O, T, L, 25, my student number on this system. And then the name of the computer, enter my password and then I got this welcome message here so the first thing I'd like you to do once you're connected is to check where you are where are we right now and the answer is PWD present working directory where do we arrive when we arrive on teach and I'm here and in principle all of you will have a different answer it's going to start the same like slash home slash L LCL UOT by OD 25 and then this here is going to be different for every one of you. So for me, it says LCLU t 25 s nineteen seventeen. That's my login. And that particular place where we are is my home. That's you know the place where you arrive when you arrive on Teach. So if you have if you have been able to do that, I'd like you now to go to another place. And that place is called Scratch. So that's CD for Change Directory, and in capital. You write, you write scratch like that, but you write a dollar before. And as you can see, as soon as you press enter, you get a new path here. It doesn't say slash home slash blah, blah, blah. It says slash scratch slash blah, blah, blah. So I want everybody to go to scratch. And the command is this one, cd dollar scratch for change directory to that particular place there. And every one of you will have a different place that's called your scratch space. So we arrived at your home space and now we're going to the scratch space. So pretty easy warm up so far. The next thing I'd like you to do is to copy a bunch of files that we will use for today's session. So as you remember, in order to copy files, you say CP for copy and then the path is a bit long because it's in like in my home, the home of the teacher, and you have to retrieve a couple of files from there. So that's home slash home slash g slash g filion slash g filion again, and then the first file that we're going to to copy is this one. So it's the one that's called like that. I'm sorry that the uh, the path is broken here on the screen so i'm going to make the uh, the font a little bit smaller so that it's not broken that's going to be maybe easier for you to to copy just this once all right so here that's the file that i i'd like you to to copy so one thing that you'll figure out sooner or later is that Linux allows you to type really fast because you can use the tab for auto completion. So in reality, all you need to do is to type dmail-o-tr 
and after that if you press tab then it will auto complete with everything and you must then not forget that there's a space dot at the end it's not very visible but what one dot means here that directory two dots means my parent one dot means right now right here in the scratch directory thank um, you Michelle, quick question copying that yes um so i just want to be sure we do type in slash home slash g slash g fillion slash g fillion slash d mail all transcript tab tab do we and then you press enter right <clears throat> space dot space dot so michelle has nicely copied the command in the chat so that in case you don't manage to copy it properly you just copy paste her stuff paste it in your session press enter but don't forget to copy the dot after I repeat that dot means here you copy from the, the source which is this dmail transcript file to the current directory which is scratch I can check that this has worked by doing ls when I do ls I can see that the file has been properly copied in my scratch directory all right, so thanks, Michelle, for putting the, the command in the, in the chat. Meanwhile, I'm going to see what's the content of this file. You can see that it finishes in FASTA, so it should ring a bell. We've seen the FASTA format last, last week. There is this .gz extension, which just means that this is a compressed file, and just so that it doesn't take a lot of space. But it doesn't bother less. Less is good enough to open the whole thing and decompressing it on the go without having to uncompress it with a G unzip. So that's a typical FASTA file. It starts here with a header, and the header has got this sign, like the greater than sign, which means it's the name of the sequence, and that sequence is called FBTOR and then a number. And then some other comments about the type. It's an mRNA, this is the exon intron structure of the gene, etc. And FBTOR stands for fly based transcript. But it doesn't really matter. What matters is that. This is a typical FASTA header, so we've seen that they look like that. And this is the sequence here of the gene that corresponds to that particular name. It's not really a gene, it's an mRNA, but that's a nucleic acid sequence. And that's typically what a FASTA file contains. Like it's a bunch of sequences that are separated by a header that has this greater than sign followed by the name of the sequence. So with less, I can use the up and down arrows in order to scroll down a little bit to see uh, what happens, but that's kind of boring, that's just DNA. And at some point, we see the end of the sequence and another one begins, if I keep pressing the down arrow multiple times. And this new sequence got another name and then there's another sequence and so on. And there are quite many sequences in this file, we're talking of 20,000 or so, probably even more. So we're not going to be able to read them all. Less just allows us to, to watch the beginning. It just be way too tedious to scroll down till the bottom. So I'm done here. I press Q, just the letter Q, small Q on my keyboard. And as soon as I do that, then I'm back to where I was here. Okay, everybody could have a look at their, at their FASTA file. Uh, Guillaume, how did you open it the FASTA from, from going to red and opening it up? So the command is less, L-E-S-S. -S, you just do that again? You so, just retype that in again? It's less. highlighted here on my screen, if you have my screen in front of you. So L-E-S-S -S, space, and then you just press D and tab, and that will have to complete because this is the only thing that's in your working directory at the moment. But the command to open is less, L-E-S-S. -S. And to quit less, you just press Q and you return to the terminal. All right, so another thing that we're going to copy. Well, before that, um, so this is a transcriptome here. And one thing that we'd like to do is to use Salmon. So we can just ask, okay, we want to start Salmon and see what we can do with it. And quite unfortunately, we see a Salmon command not found. So it seems that Salmon is not installed on Teach. In reality, it is installed, but you don't have access to it by default. So you need to do one thing before you can use most of the applications on the Teach cluster, and that's to load them. 
I'm not sure why exactly how this is built in the background, but there's this command that's called module load solomon. You press enter and then it's, it succeeds. And after you've done that, in principle, if you press solomon, if you type solomon and press enter, it's not going to complain anymore. Okay, so the command that I'd like you to type in your terminal now is module load solomon. If you're still stuck in less, don't forget to press Q to come back to the back to this major terminal here. And once you have entered module load Salmon, then calling Salmon is gonna work. I think it's going to print a lot of things on my screen now, so it's going to make everything else go away. No, not everything else. But if I just press Salmon, you see that this time it doesn't complain. It tells you Salmon version 1.4, how to use it, etc. So the thing I want to do is to index that transcriptome to be able to map some reads in it, or more accurately, to quantify some reads in it. And the command for this is going to be Salmon index, but we're not going to write it. What we're going to do instead is to copy another file from my home. So it's going to be cp slash home slash g, g filion, g filion again, and then uh, the file is called salmon underscore index dot slurm. And as usual, space dot. Once you've done that, you copy the file locally and with ls, you can see that the file is there. So the path is slash home slash g slash g filion slash g filion again. So that's my home here on the cluster. And then the name of the file is salmon underscore index dot serve. <clears throat> and as usual for copy, you need to tell where you copy and you copy here with a space dot. So I hope that you guys managed to, to copy this file as well, like the first one. And when you're done, you can look at the content of the file with less. Thank you, Ahmed, for uh, I'm not sure why you're uh, copying the previous uh, file I made so in the chat. This one has to be salmon underscore index. That's true. When you have copied the, uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, I mean, if you're unable to log in, maybe the best is that you check with, uh, uh, with Michelle. Um, so, if you have copied salmon underscore index dot slurm, then you can look at the content with less. And so it's a five line script that contains that. It starts with this kind of magical incantation slash bin bash, and then s batch time equals four hours. And that doesn't matter very much. These are things that will always be there in this type of script. And I'm going to comment this a little bit later, but right now I'd like you to focus on the next two commands. One of them is module load Salmon, and we've seen that this is the command to allow the computer to use Salmon. And the next one is Salmon index minus T, blah, blah, blah. And so that's the command that is used by Salmon to index the transcriptome. And so minus T means the target transcriptome is that, and minus I means I want the index to be called that. Dmail, Salmon, Dmail stands for Drosophila melanogaster, by the way, this is fruit fly, Salmon index. So that's the command that will allow us to index the transcriptome. And the point is that this command takes about 15 minutes to run, and this is what I'd like to not waste further time, and we're going to start it right now. And as soon as everybody started that, then I'm going to give you a 15 minute lecture about how to use the cluster but this will be running in the background. So once you have copied the file salmon index dot slurm, you can start a job with a command that's called s batch. So it's s batch salmon index. You can notice that I do s batch space s a and then I press tab and that really finishes typing really fast and more importantly without typos. So s batch salmon index dot slurm, I press enter. And you can see that it says submitted batch job such and such. And for you, it's going to give another number. And one cool thing to do is that once you've done that, you can say SQ to see what's happening about this job right now. And when you do SQ, 
you can see that my job ID, uh, like number 42, is here. Okay, my user has been truncated, but that's me here. Uh, it would continue with uh, S1917. And these are other students who have pressed enter, who have successfully managed to copy someone index.serm and to run it with this batch. So that's my job here, running on teach35. And we're going to explain in a second what that means. Uh, these are your jobs here, and you can see that they're running as well. All right, I'm going to leave a bit of time to uh, allow more people to, to submit their job there. And like I said, it's a 15 minute job. So it's going to take a bit of time before it completes. And in the meantime, we're going to watch some slides and have a, a mini lecture. Just giving a bit more time. So the job ideas here are unique to each of us. We're already at 52 now. And we see that there's nothing else on the cluster running at the moment. So it's pretty nice because we have the cluster just for ourselves. There are no other classes at the moment. Otherwise, we'd see these other competing uh, these other competing tasks running here in the background. All right, so time left is four hours. This is not the time it will take to run. It's the time that you're allowed to have this task running. In four hours, it's going to be kept no matter what, finished or not. Okay, let's just let's see. Okay, it seems that all of those who wanted to submit the job at the same time as me has, have done it. So now let's explain a little bit what we've done because there was a little fast. And so, oops, not working like that. And so- um, uh, Guillaume, before we keep going, uh, is it okay if I interrupt? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I put in the CP slash home, GFDO, GFDO, uh, salmon underscore index dot slurm and then space dot. It didn't really give me anything. I pressed enter, but then it just uh, reappears. I put it in again, and it gave me the option to overwrite. Um, yeah, just do LS. Um, like it's, not, it's not going to, uh, to do anything particular. Just LS? LS to make sure it's there, like Maureen said in the, in the chat. Okay, okay. All right, thanks, Maureen. And then you see it's there. All right, so while this is running, let's go back a little bit and then explain what, what we've been doing so far. So you got your computer at home and this is maybe a laptop, maybe a desktop, and you've been using SSH in order to connect to what is called the Teach Cluster. And that connects you to one of the computers of the cluster, but the cluster contains many computers. And that computer is called Teach01. So that's kind of the, the gateway, the entry gateway. Whenever you do SSH, you always arrive here on that particular computer, which is called Teach01. But that computer here is just a computer that is kind of, you know, the information desk, if you want. You're not allowed to really do anything here or anything important. This computer is not powerful enough, <coughs> sorry, it's not powerful enough to run all the operations. So computations are carried out on compute nodes. This is not a compute node because the entry node, Teach01, does not have enough computing power to process all our requests. <clears throat> it's not a very powerful computer. That is just a relay station. So with SSH, you come to the relay station <clears throat> and then you use Slurm. And Slurm is a system that allows you to distribute to other computers the task that they will each have to perform. So SSH brings you to a place where you're not allowed to do computations. You can, but you're going to be interrupted and you can actually cause a lot of problems for other users. What you're supposed to do is to use this scheduler called Slurm and that's the sbatch command that will actually delegate the different scripts to other computers, which are called the compute nodes. And that's what's running right now. I think we're all running on a, on a node that's called Teach35. It's one of the, of the ones that are indicated here, but it doesn't have to, at some point, if we keep uh, producing more scripts, then they will go to maybe Teach36 or some other computer that is there. So that's the first thing. You do not use Teach01 for computations. You delegate to the compute nodes with Slurm. And that's a typical architecture of a cluster. And that's not really the way that you're used to working with your own computer. It's something you have to learn when you work on shared resources like Sinet. 
Another thing that's kind of important for you to understand, like why we do the things we do, is that there's a difference between home and scratch. So the first thing we did when we logged in was to do CD scratch. We went to that place here. We didn't stay in home. So why is that? The directory that's called home, like dollar home, is for permanent storage. So as long as your account lives, your stuff on home will, will be there. It won't be deleted. Files in the directory scratch are deleted after a few months of inactivity. So anything that's on Scratch, if people don't touch it, if they don't read it, if they don't write on it, then there's an automatic garbage collection every couple of months. I think it's two or something like this. They just say this thing, if you're not interested in it, we just delete it because it's taking way too much space. So the compute nodes, the one on which our scripts are running right now, write to Scratch. And they write to Scratch only. They're not allowed to write on home. Okay, so the compute nodes write to scratch only in order to avoid saturating data storage. So why do they do that? Is because some scripts produce a lot of disk, like they use a lot of disk space, and so they will only be going to scratch. You're not allowed to make the script run on home. If you really want to keep these things, you have to then manually copy them from scratch to home, where you can keep them for as long as your account lives. But all these data producing scripts that nobody really cares about, Breathed on Scratch, and every couple of months, Scratch is just wiped out, not the whole Scratch, but your files are wiped out to recycle the space. So since we will need sign it only for a few weeks, like up until your midterm basically, we will do everything on Scratch. So we will never copy the things from Scratch to home, but that's for you to understand that if you run things the way we do, it's so that we can produce these things on Scratch. If you forget to first CD scratch at the beginning when you run the script from home is going to fail. You can have an error message that says blah 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 home blah 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 not allowed. It's because the compute nodes are not allowed to write on home. You have to make them write on scratch, which means that you have to put your Slurm script in scratch and then it's going to work. So, again, not very much the way you're used to working with your computer, but that's because this is a shared resource and like these are the rules you want to be able to work on the same computer cluster. Now the other thing that you have to understand, the last one that really makes working with a cluster a bit of a, you know, a discipline to stick to, is the time limits. So compute nodes stop working after 15 minutes by default. So the administrators of the teach clusters say, after 15 minutes by default, we're just cutting your stuff. No matter where it is in the process, we just kill it. And if it was finished, good. If it was not finished, sorry, that's your problem. That's 15 minutes is the default the max time can be increased to four hours. So as users of the Teach Cluster, they give us up to four hours, but the default is 15 minutes. If you don't say anything, then it's 15 minutes, but we're allowed you know, to ask for four hours. And we will always do that. No matter what we do, we always ask for these four hours. And it's just to make sure that we're well you know, beyond the limit of 15 minutes because some of the things that we run are dangerously close to 15 minutes, which means that if they're interrupted in the middle, then you will have buggy files. Like they will be truncated, the task will not be finished, etc. So that can cause troubles. So always we request these four hours here. For this, we include the command s badge dash dash time equals 400 in the Slurm script. So that's the line that was a little bit cryptic that we've seen. It's just to say that every time we uh, want to do any task, we always request these four hours with that line here. So that's what I wanted to uh, uh, to share with you about the way we run compute computations on a cluster. So as you type ls, now you will see that there's a new file that has appeared in your in your scratch space, which is called slurm, and then the the name of the task that you gave. I mean, you didn't give it, like you were given that, 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 that number here, dot out. So that is the log. That's pretty much what's happening on this task is being written to that particular file. Here. But one thing that I'd like you to, uh, to do right now is to look again at the salmon underscore index dot slur at that script. Now that we have a little bit more background on how to use the computer cluster, we can understand a little bit what we're doing here. So that's a script, meaning it's just a detailed recipe of what the computer has to do. The first thing is that it starts with this so-called shebang line, and it says 
everything I'm writing here is written in a language that's called Bash. Bash is the name of the language. Born again shell. That's sure why it's called this way. But anyway, the language here is Bash. The second line means uh, this S Bash time equals four. I'm requesting the whole four hours that I'm allowed to use on this cluster. Otherwise, if I don't do that, it means that I got only 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, it's going to be interrupted. Then I leave a bit of space for readability. Module load salmon. Remember, that's the command I need to, uh, to start with so that the computer has access to salmon. If you don't do that, the script is going to stop instantly as soon as you call salmon next line because it's going to say, I don't have salmon. I don't know what it is. You need to actually load it. And I don't know why. Maybe someone knows why we need to load stuff on this cluster. On my computer, it's not the case, but on the cluster, it is. <coughs> and finally, here's the, the real stuff. It happens here. Salmon, remember, that's the that's the uh, the software that's relatively recent, that is from 2017, that will allow us to quantify transcript expression. But first, as I explained in the previous class, we need to index the transcriptome. And the command to do this is salmon index. T is for transcriptome, and that's the file that we copied here. And minus I is the email salmon index. That's the name of the index. Okay, I press Q to go back here. And you see that indeed there's this thing appearing in blue here, dmail salmon index, which is the index that is produced by salmon. Let's have a look at the, at the state. SQ is now empty except for uh, 53. So one of us still has the script that is running, but for everyone else, the script seems to have terminated, terminated properly, which means that the content of dmail salmon index here is finished, or the index has been uh, has been completed all right so that's kind of nice out of curiosity we can look at the out script that is there so that's less slurm and then tab so that you can see the content there and uh, now you can use the up and down arrows to go a little bit faster in less you can also press f for forward and that will kind of shift one whole screen so you go much faster and you see that this is not very interesting this is a log file contains a lot of information about what has happened during the, the run, but like it's not really interesting for us to look at. So Q, and there is now the dmail dmail salmon index, and that's in blue because that's a directory. Okay, I can do cd dmail salmon index. So I'm going into that directory. I press enter, and I press, I tap ls, I can see that there are plenty of interesting things in it. So that's here, the index, the Salmon index. It's actually a bunch of files. And I don't really need to investigate very much what that is. This is like the trade secret of Salmon. I just know that it contains everything that's needed here to quantify the expression of transcripts. Good enough for me, cd dot dot to go back to the previous directory, which is my scratch space. giving you a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, to just fool around a little bit, make sure that everything is in your working directory pretty much the same way as in mine. Your slurm out here will have a different number, but the rest should be more or less the same. So here, this one started like six minutes ago, so it's going to be finished in what, I think four minutes or so. It's like around 10 minutes, maybe 15 at most. To run that script. So when you're there, we're going to copy one more file from my home. And the file we're going to copy, uh, forgot a G, is the reads. And that is uh, called again. That's the file that's called dmail rnac fastq.gz. Okay, as usual, you copy the whole thing. Don't forget the space and dot. When you do it, nothing happens. Like if the computer does not com does not complain, it means that it worked. By default, when Linux is silent, it means all good. It's gonna bug you, it's gonna bother you whenever it doesn't work. So you copy this file here, which is called dmail 
or in a sixth of task field of gz. I can see that it has appeared here in my scratch space. And we're going to have a look at this fast q file. And while we're having a look, I want you to remember what we saw last time, the fast q format, that it's really what comes out of the sequencer. It's usually an Illumina sequencer. And so think about the content of this file as really what came out of the sequencer. And that's an RNA-seq experiment, RNA-seq. So here we go, less, and then dmail, rnasec.fastq.gz. And when I press enter, I get a typical fastq file. Remember fastq file, each read is four lines. So which means that this is the first read here, one, two, three, four. The next read is here, and so on. And so the first line of these four lines is the name of the read. Every read has a name in the fastq file. That's a complicated name because it contains the instrument, uh, some encoding of the position of the of the dot on the glass slide, and also a proper name for that particular read. Then you have the sequence of the read proper. That's what has been decoded by the instrument. Okay. It says permission denied. Uh, for you, um, and I'm kind of surprised it should be readable. I'm not sure what you're trying to copy. Uh, don't know. I'm trying to do the 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 dmail uh, dash RNA seq uh, dot fastq dot gz space dot. Yeah, I did. I just copied exactly that. Yeah. Copy paste the command from Michelle. Um, we got the four lines of, of the fastq file. The second one is the sequence that is decoded. So that's really what the what the sequencer thinks the molecule is. The third is a plus, always, just, just like that. And then comes this relatively complicated code. Remember, that's the thread quality. And every symbol that is used corresponds to one quality. And it's kind of hard to remember exactly what corresponds to what. But if you remember, like GHI, like this capital GHI, stand for high quality, and the symbols that stand for low quality look more like question mark, uh, semicolon, etc. So we can see that the first uh, first couple of nucleotides have got weird quality. After this, it goes high for some time, but by the end of the read, the quality goes down again because it uses symbols that are associated with low quality. And that's a very typical pattern. Of Illumina. You, see, you have quite good confidence in the nucleotides at the beginning, but as the, the run progresses, the quality goes down. That's very, very typical. So here, this, this is the result of an RNA-seq experiment. So someone has extracted the RNA from these Drosophila cells or flies or whatever that is, has prepared a library using the techniques that we explained in lecture three, and then has sequenced it on a sequencer using the technology that we explained in lecture number two with an Illumina sequencer. And then we get this particular file here with the format that we saw in lecture number four. And we're ready to now use Salmon in order to quantify the expression of the reads in that whole experiment. And so again, we're going to use Slurm for that. We're going to use the isbatch command. And I have prepared another file on my home so that you can easily submit the, the, the new the new job. So that's cp slash home slash g slash g filion g filion again. And then the name of the script is salmon quant dot slurm. Same as usual. Don't forget the space dot here. And once you have done the copy with ls, you can see that there's one more file salmon quant dot slurm. Waiting a bit. In the meantime, I'll check the SQ again. Ah, so this one has been restarted for some reason because you can see that, like, it's been started 15 seconds ago. So it's going to take time before it, it completes again. And let's have a look at the new Slurm script, the one that's called 
salmon quat. Salmon quat. Again, a relatively short script, that's good. It always starts the same way. We're using the bash scripting language and we're requesting four hours. So that will always stay the same, no matter what we do. And then we're going to use salmon. So module load salmon. If we don't do that, it's going to crash first thing. And finally, we have the actual thing, the way it's going to run. Um, hmm. I think I made a, I made a, a mistake in that, in that script here. It's not going to run because the file here is is not the right one. So we're going to see how to correct that. So don't don't run it just right now. The command here it says salmon quant. That's the one for quantifying. Then we specify the index we're going to use. That's the one we just created. So minus i demand salmon index minus l a. So this an l. It's not a one. It means automatic library type. Just we're telling salmon figure everything out for us. I'm not interested in the detail. Like just find out what type of reads they are and deal with it. Minus r stands for read. So it's this file. But you can see this is not the file we have in our directory. We have tml rnsseq.fastq.gz. So it's going to fail if we run that. And then minus o means the output. You just create a new directory that you call dmail or rnsseq quant. So the, the thing we need to do is to fix here the fact that the file is not the correct one. What we have in the working directory is a file that's almost the same, dmail rnsseq.fastq, but it's been compressed. It's .gz. So we need to edit the uh, the slurm script that we have and the text editor that we have in linux the simplest one is called nano so you do nano salmon quant dot slurm so less is for read only nano is read and write so we're now able to modify the script and we got this relatively uh, sober interface where i can move i hope that you can see my my cursor here moving with the arrows but my mouse is not helping me like i have to do everything with the keyboard and i have to move the cursor where the mistake is so that's dmail rnsc.fastq and there when i'm here i enter dot gz and that's the proper name of the file that is in the directory okay and that's as simple as that nano is relatively simple to use looks a little bit like it's the 80s or the 70s all over again but otherwise it's pretty useful what's nice is that it also gives me um, a cheat sheet at the end here at the bottom of the screen it says ctrl x is for exit that's pretty much what i want to do right now so i say ctrl x and then it doesn't exit it says save modify buffer and so no will destroy changes but i'm fine with the changes i made so i type y and then it moves to the next question file name to write salmon quant dot slurm yeah i don't want to change the name so i press enter and finally after these three operations i control x to quit y to say that i did i do want to uh, save the changes and enter to say that the name of the script is just fine then i have modified the script i'll do it one more time for those of you who haven't seen it uh, the first time around so if you're if I went too fast just just wait I'm going to do it again for the others the ones who have managed to do it I want to just check with less that things are indeed like they should that's fine you can see that now there is this dot gz that has been added to the file name so I'm going to edit the file again with nano to give enough time for everybody to see how I do it so the command is nano space salmon quant slurm and then I press enter and that starts now. You can see GNU nano 231. And I'm using here the arrows to move to the place where I want to do the edits. The edits are here, so I can put whatever I want, but what I want is the GZ. When I've done that, I press Ctrl X. Now it says here, save modify buffer. I say Y, and as soon as I press Y, you don't see it on my screen, because as soon as I press Y, it has already gone to the next screen. Find name to write summon quant.slurm, and as soon as I press enter, it will disappear. Okay, so in principle, my file now is good to go. 
And as you guessed, the last thing is that I'm submitting the, the command. So salmon quant.slurm. And here we go, that's the job 55. If I ask SQ to see where it is, ooh, ooh, you guys are fast. You're really going as fast as me. So I'm 55, we're going until 59. And this job is much, much faster. Like it's gonna take one or two minutes, but not much more. I can check the content of my directory. You can see that there is this newly created directory dmailrnc.quant, and this is where the information is going to go. So right now, all I need to do is just to wait for the job to finish, but you can see that this is already done. I'm number 55, and so that's already finished. Pretty cool. Now we can have a look at what the content of Gmail or seek quant. So by the way, I hope you, you have observed how fast Salmon is, like the fact that we have been able to index the genome kind of took us 10 minutes, but once you're done, things go incredibly fast. Salmon is absolutely amazingly fast for what it does. So let's go inside this directory, Gmail or seek quant, Gmail or seek quant, ls to see what's inside this is a bunch of stuff but the only file i need the one that i like is quant.sf quantification.shellfish or sailfish I'm not sure exactly what that stands for this sf so i want to open it with less quant.sf i press enter and i got a table that looks like that so the first column is the name of the of the transcript so the very first here is this uh, Fly-based transcript number 007, etc. The length of the gene, or more accurately, the length of the transcript, and that's 3537. Uh, the effective length. So, Salmon does some magic. It doesn't really explain how, but it does a good job of just changing the length of the gene in order to compensate for different biases. There are plenty of biases that happen during these experiments, and they're known. There, some of them are even understood. And so that's why it says, in order to be fair, to quantify it in a good way, I need to make the gene a bit shorter compared to other ones, because some parts of the gene are actually impossible to map to for some reason, or it's got too much Gs in a row or something like this, and Gs are known to cause some problems. Okay, then the TPM, and TPM stands for transcript per million, and the TPM is zero, so this gene has got zero transcript per million, and the actual number of reads that was mapped to that transcript is zero. So of course, there is no evidence whatsoever that this gene is expressed, not a single read corresponded to the sequence of that gene, therefore the TPM here is zero. So be careful that because of the tab, the the, the names are not aligned. Okay, it looks like num reads here is uh, that column, but it's not. It's the last one. And you can see that depending on, you know, whatever happened on the, on the numbers, they can be shifted like on this line. So don't get confused. The TPM, the, the column that we do care about the most, is the one before the last. Let's check that gene here. Uh, 007003. It's got a TPM of 254 and something. Okay, it means 254 transcripts per million. If we put all the transcripts at random in the bag, we put one million of them, and then we look at what we have. 254 out of this 1 million will be that gene here. And that corresponds to a gene that had three reads. It's not a lot, okay? Only three reads were, were kind of, you know, telling us that this is coming from that particular gene here. But that's just a game of converting reads per length. Remember, we first compute the RPKM, and then we weigh the RPKM in order to get the TPM. And we don't have to do any of this. Salmon takes care of it us in just one minute it's, it's quantified all the genes so that's pretty amazing here and again using less we can scroll down a bit to see what there is but you know it's just a very long list of genes with their expression there's not much to do right now uh, so hi i did what you told me sorry by mistake uh, not sure to who you're talking to and not sure what you're referring to that's me so that's the uh, that's the story of quant.sf here remember that this is inside the output dmail-rna-quant 
So one thing that you may be interested in doing is to see what are the genes that, are, that have the highest expression level. And for this, we need to sort the rows. And there's this pretty nifty command, Linux sort, and then minus rnk4 prompt.sf. And then we're using this vertical symbol for pipe and then head. So let's explain what that means. Sort is going to sort the rows. Uh, minus R means reverse order. We want to have the high numbers first, the low numbers last. So we want a decreasing or reverse order. N means we want numerical order, not alphabetical order. And K4 means the key is the fourth column. That's the one with the TPM. Okay, so that command here will sort the file with the highest expression first and the lowest expression last. But I don't want the whole thing. This file is pretty big. And so I'm using this pipe head command here to say, just show me the first 10 or the first five or whatever that is. So this pipe command means take the output of that particular command and then process it with that particular command. Just show me the head. And when you do this, it takes just a couple of instants and you can see that the winner is that gene here, whatever that is. Fly based transcript, blah, 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 866. So it's got two reads, but it's got a TPM of 26,710. Well, because its effective length is really tiny, like seven, five nucleotides, 5.7 nucleotides. But that's the one that has the highest expression here. Okay, so that's a bit of Linux jargon. You don't really need to remember that, just for you to understand that with a bit of comfort, when you become a bit more comfortable with the commands, you can do pretty much anything with Linux here. All right, and that's that's it. That's what I wanted to show you for Salmon. So what we're going to do, because we have plenty of time, really, uh, I'm going to answer questions right now, if you have any, or if anything wasn't clear. Then we're going to have a short break, and then we're going to do the second part about VWA. But let's answer some questions if you guys have any. seem like people are raising their hand. I don't see anything in the chat. Let's check the queue here. Wow, everything is done. It seems that those of you who wanted to do the, the exercises at the same time have been able to. That's really nice. I think I was a little bit afraid that we'd have some issues with the clusters. Like as you've noticed, there were two days when the, clusters were, when the cluster was down. So I'm pretty happy that two days were running fine and that we could do all this without problems. All right, no question. Then a five minute break. Let's even say seven minute break because we have plenty of time. So we meet again at 10 past three. Okay, so welcome back. Now we're going to see the second part of today's session, which is to use BWA. So remember, someone is to quantify reads in a transcriptome. BWA is to map them. We did a slightly different processes. You don't really care about how many reads go to which gene. You actually want to know exactly where they go in the, in the genome. So I'm going back to my scratch space. So I was, as you can see here in Dmail on a C quant. I do a cd dot dot, brings me back to scratch. And I'd like to introduce to you a new command, which is ls minus l. And so that's the same as ls, but it shows in a different way it displays the things in the directory. So it's kind of more tidy. You have some information which is there, which is pretty handy. The other thing is that there is this very widely accepted shortcut for it, which is LL for long list. You can see that when I do LS minus L or LL, it's exactly the same. So I can see a little bit more than just what is in the directory. I can see here the names that are there and I can see when they were created. So that's very recently in all of them, all there. And this is the size here. That's the number of bytes that they occupy on the disk. And this thing, like it's me, it's me again. Uh, not me again, it's the group that we're together. And these are the permissions, what is allowed to do with this file by different people. So sometimes, you know, I list the directory like this, but personally, I prefer to see things in that way but it's up to you. You can just say ls if you prefer the compact version, but I can I prefer the expanded version. 
So next up, we're going to copy the genome of Drosophila, not the transcriptome, the genome. So here we go, that's as usual, same place, home g dot gfilion, gfilion again, and then that's dmail, all chromosome. Okay, and you see that I just typed dmail, all c, and then when I press tab, that auto completes. I don't forget the dot, that takes just a couple of instants. And after that, I have one more file. I'm highlighting the command that you have to type in your, uh, in your command line interface. I have one more file, which is the first, the, the one that's called dmail or chromosome here. That's the one that we're going to work on. There's a question in the chat that I didn't see before. How do we know when the sbatch command is done? That's a good question. And it's pretty much a matter of sq. Okay, so like you can see your task in, in the queue, and if you just keep pressing SQ, then uh, you will see that it has disappeared. And once it's disappeared, it's a good sign, it means that this is finished. So, if you have literally no idea how long the, the task takes, then it can be a bit annoying because you have, you know, like are you going to check every minute, every hour, every day, etc. So that can be a bit annoying. The best is to get an idea how, how long your task will run, and then you check around the time when you expect your, your own SQ. For you to know everything you will have to do on these assignments and on the, on the midterm is approximately 15 minutes. Okay, nothing is really running more than 15 minutes. I've calibrated it so that it takes approximately 15, but it can be a bit more, and very often it's going to be less. Um, uh, when I type one one, it said command not found. Yeah, that's ll or long list. Two lowercase letters. Also, um, another thing while well, people are kind of you know catching their bearing is that um, uh, Taylor pointed out to me that the midterm was not accessible. So I apologize for that. I thought it was, but because of some um, of some mistake, then you guys could not watch the questions of the midterm. So I thought that you guys had already access to the midterm, at least that was the point. So from now it is. Uh, you should have been able to have access to it from day one of the class, but it was just for you to see the questions. You didn't have the skills to actually work on them, but from today, you do. Like everything that we see here is pretty much what you need that is sufficient to do parts one and two. You won't get much more information about these parts in the coming class. The coming class will be to do part three. So really, after that session of today, you can, and I think you should, start working on the midterm because you have everything you need in order to make progress with it. You have all the skills, you have access to the cluster, etc. So sorry that it was not available before, and thanks, uh, Theodore, for pointing this out to me. On the other hand, anyway, you didn't really have the skills to do them before today, so it's not a huge loss. It was just to allow you to see the questions, to start thinking about them. Okay, so... Now you should have now this file and being able to see it with a ll if you want it or ls. So that's the genome. Let's have a look at it. So less, and then we open that file here. So that's dml command o chromosome. You can see the way I type. Right? I type dm, then tab, then you know a tab, and then c tab. That's the way that a Linux person starts writing at some point. And we see that this is a FASTA file. As expected, it's got the FASTA header line here. That's 2L. And then we've got a long sequence. So that's the whole sequence of chromosome 2L from Drosophila. And we can go down here to see what happens. But we'd go down and down and down forever. Like this is a pretty long text, chromosome 2L. I can go back to the top of the file in less by pressing small g on my keyboard. That teleports me up to the top. And you can see that here that's chromosome 2L. The length here is indicated there. Okay, and there's a couple of other information here about the version, like it's really 6.36 because the, the genomes keep evolving as people keep resequencing, resequencing them, correcting mistakes, etc. So that's the chromosome 2L as per version 6.36, in case that matters. And that, that often does matter which version of the genome you use. The length is here again, etc. So I've got some additional information 
uh, on top of just the fact that this is chromosome 2L. But the next chromosome will be so much further down that it will be very difficult for me to show it to you. So the next thing we need to do is to use BWA. So let's get started, BWA, and of course, command found, because it's the same thing as Solman, it's not loaded. Well, we know what to do, right? We say module load BWA. What can possibly go wrong? And then it takes a while, then I get some things in red. It did not work. So why is that? It's because unlike Solomon, BWA needs to have another module loaded on top of it before you can load BWA. So that's a bit annoying, but that's the way it is, and there's no way around it. So we got to comply. And that module is called GCC. The GNU C compiler, so that's um, just a you know a programming language that most mathematics software are written in is GCC, is C sorry, and the compiler is GCC, and for some reason it's needed in order to run VWA. So we do it um, like module load sorry, GCC sorry about this, and then you can do module load BWA the Burroughs Wheeler alignment, and that will work. Okay, so don't, don't forget, when you run BWA, you do need to also load GCC before. Okay, so here we go. Now if we do BWA, we get something that works. So that's BWA version 0 0.7, it doesn't matter very much. What matters is that there are the new commands index and mem. And the first thing we want to do is to index the genome. And this time, I haven't been really nice to you, even less than usual, because I haven't provided a script for you to copy from my home. You have to make your own. So you're going to have to use Nano, remember, like the text editor, to recreate a new script that will be, and that will allow you to uh, index the genome. So we're increasing the level of difficulty bit by bit. My recommendation is that you don't create a script from scratch all the time, you take a template. So the one that was kind of close to what we want to do is the Salmon index. So we're going to copy the Salmon index slurm script to make a new one. So Salmon index slurm, and I will copy it to a new file that, that I'm going to call, of course, bwa underscore index slurm. And when I do that, of course, has created a new file, which is here, BWA index term, and that's exactly the same content as Salmon index term. That's not what I want, but that's a good template. Okay? So that's the command here cp Salmon index term to BWA index term. You can call the file the way you want, it doesn't matter very much, but I recommend you call it something meaningful like BWA index. And once I have my template, I'm going to edit it so that it contains the commands that I actually want to use. So nano bwa tab, and that auto completes to bwa index .slurm. And that brings me to my very sober interface of nano. The first two lines, remember, they're always there. We will never change them. We always request four hours, and we always use the bash programming language. Okay, module load Salmon, no, we don't do that. We say module load GCC, then module load BWA. Okay, remember, first GCC, the GNU C compiler, then BWA, the one we want to use. Okay, then it was not Salmon index, that was BWA index. And the way this command works is that, um, what was the last input? What was the last input? Not sure what you mean, the last input. Uh, so before before you came to this page, um, after you put after you put bwa underscore index dot slurm and then uh, then ls no not ls then then you just press enter. Um, then it's nano bwa underscore index dot slurm and that brings you here. And so we have BWA index, and it's not the file DML all transcript here, that was DML all chromosome. And the rest is not needed. So BWA is kind of a little bit more 
friendly to use at that stage down at Salmon in the sense that the command just has to be PWA index T metal chromosome or whatever is the name of the genome that you want to index here. Okay, so your file should typically look like that. I'm going to leave it on screen a couple more moments so that you have time to really copy. If you make a typo here, unfortunately, your script's not going to run. And then you will notice it maybe early, maybe late. And so make sure that this looks like that. I haven't modified the first two lines here. They are the same. Bin bash and as bash time equals four hours. I've written then module load GCC, module load PWA, and then the actual index command, which is PW index, D metal chromosome, etc. For the second line, was it supposed to have two dash or just one? Two dashes here. Okay, this one, anyway, you don't modify it, but it's dash dash time equals four hours. It's like it's not always visible clearly that there are two dashes, but that's two. Sometimes you get one dash, sometimes you get two dashes. Like you kind of get used to it at some point when you when you're in the Linux world. Usually it's one dash and one letter for the small version, and two dashes and the whole world, the whole word. Okay, like because you write time in complete, the convention is that you'd have dash dash time. But it would be, for instance, maybe there is another way of writing it, which would be dash t for just time. So there's a short option and the long option they're called all right i think that's enough time for you to have copied this uh, to get out Control x save modified buffer yes y for yes find them to write to just press enter to say that we don't want to change the name of the file so this file now has been changed just to prove it to you you can see that the initial file here, BWA index term was 127 27 bytes, and now it's 113 bytes, so it's not the same file anymore. And I'm ready to submit. So, s batch, BWA index slurm, and I press enter. And just to make sure that this is kind of running, I check it here, and I want to make sure that it's not crashing instantly, basically. That's always the first thing I do. 113, 114, uh, I'm not sure what you guys are talking about. Um, and so the um, the thing I do is I always do SQ instantly in order to uh, make sure that the script hasn't crashed instantly, that this is kind of running at least you know 30 seconds, something like this. If it crashes before, then something's gone wrong. All right, so that's pretty nice. Um, like it seems to be running, and this one is not going to be as long as Salmon in principle. Like this is more like five minutes or something like that. So while this is running, I'm showing again the structure of the directory, and I'm going to do the nano bit again, in case some people haven't managed to do it. So the command is nano pwa underscore index learn. That brings me to the nano page here, and the file should look like that. Right. Like these two lines never changed. They come from the fact that I've copied the template from Salmon index, and I've replaced the module load Salmon by module load GCC, module load PWA. I don't know why GCC is needed for PWA but not for Salmon. No idea. And then the actual command to index the genome, which is PWA index, and then the name of the genome. We can decompress it or keep it in compressed version. PWA is fine with both. And then to exit that is Control X. But in my case, because I haven't touched the file here, it directly brings me out because I haven't made any edits. Okay, it's still running, so great. It's not crashed, that's actually good news. Any questions or any things you'd like me to clarify while this is running? Uh, so after 
I don't know if anyone's everyone, anyone raised their hand, but after the nano BWA underscore index, you change it to modulo GCC, modulo BWA, and then you edit it a little bit more. Um, you come back. Yeah, so you do. Oh, how, okay, so after it says, after we type in S batch BWA index slurm, submit it to batch job 202082. What do we type after that? SQ, I mean, you don't have to do anything, it's running, but if you want to see the uh, the status of your of your job, you do SQ. Okay. And what happens after that? Like, do we well, you see the, just wait? Yeah, well, you just see the list of running commands and you just wait. Okay. So still running here. Um, if I remember, yeah, it's some, somewhere around five minutes to run this one, but that depends a little bit on other considerations, including like how many scripts are running at the same time. The more you load the, uh, the nodes and the more, of course, things run slowly. Question in the chat. What is the role function of GCC? Does it compile? I think I missed it. I do not know. It's a very good question. I wish I knew more about this. So when I use GCC on my computer, it's indeed to compile the code. So which means that you create the code once and after this you don't need GCC anymore because the code is already running. So why would you need to load GCC for something that's already compiled? That's a bit of a mystery to me. But anyway, that's the, that's the thing. So my guess is that this module load stuff, there is a compilation step at some point. And that's just hiding the fact that the things are compiled just on the go. But I'm not quite sure, actually. the. Uh, it's a pretty elaborate cluster, the Teach cluster. It actually runs on something that's called Niagara, which is, I think, the biggest cluster of Toronto, like the computational cluster. And they have just kept a little part of it for teaching purposes, like, you know, old computers that are maybe uh, five or 10 years old, things that are not exactly uh, like state of the art. They keep it for teaching, but that's a pretty elaborate cluster. And the guys who run this at sign it are pretty good and I don't understand everything they do. Most of them are physicists actually, which means that uh, they're more used to people running um, simulations for physics. Biologists are not the main users of the cluster, I think. So there's also a cultural component. Sometimes they use things that are very popular in physics, but not really popular in biology, and it's hard for me to follow. Okay, the genome is indexed, as we're talking, like most of the of the tasks are finished. But thanks for your question, Margaret. It's a great, great question. I wish I knew the answer. So let's have a look at the content of our directory. This was here, DML or chromosome R636. That was the genome. And we now have these files here that have been added by BWA. We're quite confident that the indexing worked because our job is no longer in the list. So it seems that everything ran as it should. So again, the index is not just one file, it's a bunch of files, just like in the case of Salmon. The difference is that uh, BWA doesn't create a new directory with everything. It puts it in the same directory where you had the original genome here. Okay, so all these things, there, there, and there, are like this is the index created by BWA, and this is the genome that we had in the beginning. So let's now copy the reads, the fastq file, which again is in my home. So cp home, g, g filion, g filion again. And they are called uh, dmail dash genomic. And you have two files because it's a paired and read file. There's two files. So the way I do it is that I'm saying cp slash home slash g slash gfilion gfilion dmail genomic underscore star which means complete with everything that matches the beginning and then space dot that takes a while and i can see that i have not one more file but two more files dmail dash genomic underscore one slash q dot gz and also dmail dash genomic underscore two 
Okay, so the command here is dmail dash genomic underscore because they both start with that and then underscore star to say everything that matches the beginning. There's another question in the chat while you guys are copying the files this way, I'm going to answer it. Are there packages like BWA and Salmon that exist in Python? What is the benefit of doing it in Unix? Again, an excellent question. So Python is an amazing programming language. I love Python, I program with it all the time. And C is also an amazing programming language. And I love C and I program with it all the time. And the thing is that what I would do in C is very different from what I would do in Python. And I use C for speed of execution. When I want the code to run really, really, really fast, then I'm going to run it in C because there is no way to write code that runs that fast in Python. And that was pretty much the same logic uh, for people who develop BWA and Salmon. Like they wanted to squeeze as much speed as they could get at the time when you run the scripts. And for this, they code it in C and not in Python. Like there is not really any way to get that level, that speed, if you program in Python only. And why is that? I'll just keep it relatively high level, is because C talks directly to your computer like the instructions that you give in C are kind of very close to telling you, you can, like your CPU what to do and Python doesn't do that. Python has an intermediate level of interpretation it's called a scripting language, an interpreted language which means that every command needs to be first interpreted and that command is then passed to your computer and that layer here like this double step process makes Python inherently slower than C that's why you cannot have the same speed as you get in C. So now you ask, then why use Python if it's so slow? Well, it's because it's much nicer to program and you make much fewer mistakes when you have this level of interpretation. Like that here is really buffering you against a huge number of mistakes and bugs that you put. So when you want to code fast, like you develop fast, you develop in Python. When you want to, when you have the time to develop and you have plenty of time to fix your bugs, but you want to code to run crazy fast at the time you use it, you program in C. And that's why there is no readability ray and salmon in Python only. All right. Um, so in principle, by now, you should have the two files. So let's have a look at them. These are, again, fastq files. So I'm going to open the first one, dmail genomic one. And we have the typical structure of fastq files. Oops, sorry about that. Come on. Typical structure of fastq files with four lines per read. You can see that the name of the reads are like pe read one uh, dash one slash one. So it means paired and read. That's me. I changed the name to make it clear that this is not one read. These are two reads per read in a sense, paired and read. And the slash one means is the first read of the pair. That's the sequence that has been decoded by the Illumina machine. That's the quality here. You can see that it's pretty good. It's most, mostly J's, F, etc. These are typically associated with high quality. So a nice quality read here. And so remember here at PE read dash one slash one. Let's have a look at the other file. So we do dmail genomic underscore two. Now the name of the read is PE read one slash two. So that's, that's the mate of the other read. So that's the same molecule, and it was read twice, once from one end, and that's the paired and read one, and the other one, it was read from the other end, and that's paired and read two. So that is here, this two, that is after the slash, means it's the second read from the same molecule. This is a paired and read file. So we got two files, but in reality, they describe the same molecules, just different ends of the molecule, either that one or that one. So that's why we've got two files, and we're going to now map them using BWA. So the way we're going to do this is, again, by creating a Serum script that we're going to submit. So let's get started. I'm taking my template, so I copy BWA index Serum to BWA mem.slurm I don't want to start a script from scratch I want to copy a template 
because it always has the things that are kind of useful for me, like the first lines, etc. I always want to use something that already worked. I'm going to make fewer bugs if I take something that works from the beginning. And then I added the script with nano, BWA maps term. Okay, so bin bash doesn't change. S bash times equals four. We don't change it here. Module load GCC and module load BWA, we keep it. Okay, so these are the things that we need to have in order to use BWA. That's fine. But I'm not going to use index. So this is done already. So the command is BWA mem. So that stands for maximal exact match. And that's the mapping strategy that BWA uses. So that's the command to say map, map the reads here. And the first argument I have to give is the name of the index genome so the genome has been indexed we keep it as is and then i'm just giving the names of the two files that i'm going to map inside that index inside that index genome and so the names were dmail dash genome mic underscore one dot fastq.gz and then the other one dmail genomic two fastq.gz that's the command here okay bwa mem for map the name of the genome here the mineral chromosome etc and then the first file i want to map and the paired and mate that i need to map email genomic underscore two fastq.gz so unlike Salmon, if I do that, it's going to spur everything on screen, and that's not going to be very useful. I want to keep it in a file, so I'm using that symbol here, greater than, and saying uh, something like mapped.sam. And if you remember, the sam format is really the one that corresponds to the output of BWA, the map reads. So don't forget here to put this redirection symbol, which means take the output of that command here, which would be all on screen, and then we get lines and lines and lines of things looking like gibberish, and put the content of that output in the file called map.sam, and that will create it for me if that doesn't exist just yet. I'll leave it on screen a couple more moments for you to copy that line here. It's a annoyingly long one, so try to not make typos, BWA mem, that here's the name of the file that was there before and here quite careful when you copy that because if you make a typo there it's not going to run okay dmail genomic underscore one dot fastq dot gz dmail genomic underscore two fastq dot gz okay control x to exit y to save the changes enter to not change the name of the script so my script is here, BWA mem serm, and I'm ready to submit it as batch BWA mem serm. And as usual, as soon as I submit it, I make sure that my task is in the queue here. I'm number 84, that's here. After five seconds, it hasn't crashed yet, so that's pretty good news. I didn't seem to have made some C typo or something like this. I'm still in the race, that's pretty nice, and you guys too, that's even nicer. So this one is kind of fast. If I remember, this is one or two minutes here uh, in order to run this command. So we're going to have the answer pretty soon. All right, once again, I'm going, in case that was too fast for you, I'm going to open again the, the script like the nano part. So that's BWA mem slurm. Your file should look like that. I hope that was enough time for people to correct the typos if there are any. Okay, it's finished already. So BWA is also incredibly fast. One thing I have to say is that I also have downsampled these files so that we don't wait forever. If you have millions and millions of, of reads, it will take hours to map. But well, we don't have millions and millions.
Okay, so let's have a look at what happened now. We have this new file called map.sam here. So that's the output of PWA. And remember, this is a SAM file. Like this is the format for aligned reads. So I can't wait to see the results. I'm using less to see map.sam. And let's see what happens. That looks like that. Okay, so I don't see any reads. I don't see anything that seems to make a lot of sense. What is it? So these at SQ lines, they are the header. Like the SAM format has got a pretty long header. And so that gives me all the information that I need, even more than I need, about the genome that was used for this mapping. So SM stands for sequence. And then 2L, remember that's chromosome 2L. That's the first that we had in the FASTA file of the genome. And LN is its length. So it tells me that this is header. There is a sequence called 2L that has this length. There is another sequence called 2R that has this length, and so on. So I can go down a bit, and you can see that there are a lot of such sequences, and they have pretty you know, idiotic names, like a bunch of numbers, and a pretty small length, like 2,000. So what is that? Well, welcome to genomics. Like the genome is not perfectly assembled. There are these tiny, tiny contexts. Nobody knows where they are. We have their location, but they could be on pretty much any chromosome. It's not known. And so people have thought it's a good idea to just put them in the genome to say, yeah, yeah, there are these sequences, but they're not assembled. So they are floating contexts, and we don't know on which chromosome they are. And you don't have just a few, you have a lot. There's approximately 2,000 of them, which means that the header is approximately 2,000 lines it's pretty annoying. So instead of using the arrows to scroll down like I'm doing right now, I'm going to use the F key to go forward one screen at a time. And I'm going to press on it like a madman to fast forward to the interesting parts. See, so there's quite a lot of, of this really boring information. At some point, we even lose hope. But eventually, we get there to something that looks to make sense. And I'm pressing the up arrow so that you can see the distinction like the last line of the header is this one and after that we can see pe read one here that's good that's where i want it to be but this header is pretty annoying and we'll see in a second how we can deal with it the other annoying thing is that the lines of the sound format are pretty long and so they wrap around you see like this one here is one line and that makes it pretty hard to align things and to know what is what it just looks like gibberish so this one trick that I really like is to make them not wrap around. Like they will just go out of the screen, they'll disappear, but at least the beginning of the lines will be nicely aligned. And the way to do this is to press inside less minus capital S. And when I do that, at the bottom, maybe you see it says chop long lines, press return, and I press return, and bang. I got something that's a little bit more tidy when I do that. So this this command is minus capital S, enter. Finally, that makes sense. And we can see that the very first two lines are PE read one and PE read one. It appears twice. Okay. And why is that? It's because these are the two ends of the same molecule that was sequenced. Like the first here is the one for file one, the second is the one from file two. And you can see that they are mapped on chromosome 3R. Uh, P read 1 is mapped at that location here, 564. And the other one is also mapped on 3R at that location, 316. So it's not exactly the same location. They're, they're not exactly at the same position, of course, because they're not the same sequence. So here, that's the name of the read. Here, that's the flag. We'll come back to this in a second. The place, the chromosome where they're mapped, and that's the position. And that's here the quality. 60 is top quality, so BW is quite sure that both of them are where it says they are. Okay, then there is this uh, cross-reference of each other. So this equal means the other read is mapped on chromosome 3 or as well. And here this is the position of my mate. Okay, and the other one says the position of my mate is that one. And my mate is 349 nucleotides upstream of me. And the other one says, my mate is 349 nucleotides downstream of me. That has too much. And then comes the sequence and all stuff that I don't really care about at that stage. Okay, so that's all good. 
that's the way the FASTA file looks like. And one thing is, if you remember, uh, I've told you that uh, everything that's below quality 20 in general is not really nice. We want to use only everything that's above quality 20. So there's this nice tool that we're going to use in order to see only some parts of the SAM format. So this is called SAM tools. And of course, if you do SAM tools, it says SAM tools command not found. Now we know the drill. This is module load SAM tools. And here, be careful. That works, but it's because I have loaded GCC before. You also need GCC to use SAM tools. But right now, because we have done it already, it works. I'm just saying that for future reference. If that fails, it's just because you have to load GCC before. Okay, so we have SAM tools, and there is this thing that's called SAM tools view, which is pretty nice. And if I do SAM tools view map.sam and I pipe the output to less, and that's this vertical bar command that we've seen just like for head before, and I press enter. Then I got a nice surprise, is that the long header that was really annoying me is gone. Okay, I'm coming back to this here command, that's SAM tools view, then the name of the SAM files you want to watch, and then pipe, less. This vertical bar is the pipe symbol. When I do this, I get, I skip the header, which is pretty nice, so I can get right to the interesting bit. Again, because I'm in less, I do minus capital S, and you can see that that is the same as before, except that I skipped the header. Pretty nice. But we can do better. We can do much better. So I'm pressing Q to quit less. As we can ask Sam Tools to select only the reads of interest to me. And one thing that I can do is to say minus Q20 for quality 20 and up. Show me only the reads that have a high quality. Quality 20 and up. So the same command as before, minus Q20. Okay, and I'll keep doing minus capital S so that we have a tidy output. Okay, that looks nice. And now the difference is that quality here are always going to be above 20. And so if we scroll down a bit, we can see that, for example, paradigm number 25 has been removed. 25 didn't, didn't make it because the quality was too low. So it's not been selected. So SAM tools allow me to just focus on reads with certain properties, like good quality reads, quality above 20. One thing that I can do, which is quite interesting, is to count them as well. So instead of piping to less, I use this option minus C here, which just counts the reads that pass the quality threshold. There are 93,055 reads that are above quality 20. One little trick that I forgot to mention is how do I tap so fast is a sequence that I tapped before. I'm pressing the up arrow. So if you just keep pressing up arrow, you go through the previous commands that you've entered, and that's a, a quick way to regenerate the command that you used before. So when you press up, you, you're going to scroll up the commands that you typed before, and when you press down, then you're going to scroll down to see the one that you like. Okay, that's, that, that saves you a lot of typing. I forgot to mention that. Okay, so that's it for quality 20, but there are other things that we can do. For instance, we can ask, uh, what are the genes, what are the reads, sorry, that are on the reverse strand, the one that are mapped on the opposite strand? Like there's the reference strand of the genome, what are the reads that are mapped like this, not like that? And the command for this is minus F16. So that means filter 16. If you remember last week's class, there is this flag field, which is the second column. And every question has a, has a name, a number. And question 16 is, is it reversed? So if you say minus F16, then it will say, yeah, I'm taking only the ones that have answered yes to that question. And then I'm piping the output to less here to see what I get and again showing only like with capital minus s to align everything you can see that now the reads appear only once okay read one read two read three read four etc 
etc. is because remember they're paired n. If one is on the forward strand, the other one is on the reverse strand. They cannot be both on the reverse strand or both on the forward strand. They really are, are read like that. So which means that I have only one of the two reads of the pair. And so these are the ones now that are mapping like this on the genome with that option. Same thing, I can count them like minus C to count the reads that are on the reverse, reverse strand and that's 50,000 or so. And if I want the opposite, the one that are not on the reverse strand, the command is minus capital F instead of minus small f. So filter out instead of filter in. And we see that we have approximately the same number. Well, that's logical. If everything is, you know, one read like this, one read like that, then you should have as many reads on the forward as reads on the reverse strand in the genome. So now how do I see how many reads are on one chromosome? How do I count them? Well, the answer is you can't, unfortunately. You have to do a little bit more work for that. You have to index the, uh, the SAM file. So how do I index the SAM file? The answer is you also can't. You have to do a bit more work for that. You have to sort it first. So we're going to now sort the SAM file, then index it, and that will allow us to start counting reads in different regions of the genome. So the command for sorting a file is called SAM tool sort. Okay. I want to sort map.sam and I want the output to be in a new file that's called mapped-sorted but then I say .bam so why is that? Uh, sam is, is the text format and bam is the compressed format by default sam to sort for some reason that's kind of a mystery to me decides that it will compress the result so creating a BAM file. So BAM is just a SAM file, except that this is compressed, just like GZ or 7-zip or RAR, you know these things. So I do that, so I'm sorting the file based on the position of the read. So now they're not in the position that were given in the FASTQ file, they have been ordered. And once this is done, I can do SAM tools, index, mapped, sorted. And I don't need to specify anything. It's going to do it just by itself. I don't need to say where to store it. Okay, sam to sort, and then you, you sort it into a BAM file, not a SAM file. And then sam to index, and that stores the index locally. So if you look at the content of the directory, you see that map.sam is here, map sorted is here, and then this new file, which is map sorted BAM by, like BAM indexed. That's the, that's the index here. We don't need that. We, we can't even open it. There's nothing interesting here. But that allows us to count where reads are in the genome. So with that, we can now see how many reads, for example, are in chromosome uh, 12, let's say. So we're going to, to count the reads in mapped sorted BAM. So that's the command here for counting. Sam tools view minus C. We're going to count in the sorted BAM, not in the mapped SAM. And if I say 2L here, then it will count only the ones that are in chromosome 2L. And there are 17,000 of them, 824. But we usually don't care about this. We want to have a certain quality to know do they really map in chromosome 2L? Yeah, in that case, they must have minus quality 20. And when you do that, then you see that you lose a couple, like 800 of them or so were mapped to qual to, to L, but not with high quality. So if you say, well, only the thing that is kind of sure mapped to quality 20, these guys disappear. And you have a couple of options. You could do the same with the ones that map on the reverse read, on the, former, on the forward read with quality 20 on chromosome to L and that would work just the same. So the point is that in order to count the reads that map to certain locations, like whole chromosomes or regions of the chromosome, you first need to sort with SAM to sort and then to index. And after you've done that, then you can finally make commands like that. SAM to U minus C for counting, but this is on the sorted BAM, not on the initial mapped SAM file. 
And that's it. That's pretty much already a, a deep introduction to read mapping with BWA and analyzing the results with some tools. We have time for questions, if you guys have any. And otherwise, that's pretty much all you need in order to start answering parts one and parts two of the midterm. Any questions? So for the midterm, are you gonna do it with us too? Gonna to help us out? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see what happens so if, if you have read the, the syllabus you see you see that anything that's a sneaky attempt at getting the answers from me will actually get you penalty points so i'm really not someone you know sneaky answers things. what if i go for the direct the direct, the direct <laughs> and, uh, i haven't said anything about this maybe it works who knows you, you should try <laughs> yeah. so i have a question about this this is uh this is very complex, but this program, we're using it for what purpose exactly? Just so like, in the simplest way. Well, <clears throat> there's no one, one usage, but here, for instance, what could be happening? These guys, they have the reference genome of Drosophila. And what they'd mm -hmm. like to know is that they, they just catch Drosophila in the wild, which is why it is actually, and they'd like to know what is the genome of that Drosophila? And mm -hmm. like starting to sequence the genome from scratch is a lot of work. It's really a lot of work. But what you can do instead is just to say, I'm going to sequence not a lot of reads, like enough. And I just have to know where they go on the reference genome to highlight the differences. So basically what they're doing is that they're resequencing a particular organism with a mm -hmm. reference genome and that is pretty easy with BW. you don't have to restart everything from scratch so what they would do is to map the reads to the to the reference prosophila genome highlight every difference to say that particular organism like that fly had got a t here and they had a g there so like you get all the snips basically so you're kind of snipping the whole drosophila by doing that you need to map the reads because you're just sequencing the genome and the, the mapping process allows you to highlight the differences between the reference and that particular fly. That could be what they're doing, but there's no, you know, like there's no single answer to that question. Of course, like the limit is the imagination. You got DNA, you got a genome, you cannot find where these pieces of DNA go in that genome. Then the questions are the logical questions that you ask. Do we use this for the exam too? the midterm uh, remember what i said about sneaky answers so that oh. you think. <laughs> no because i know I'm, I'm just asking if like we use this program for it like are we supposed to you remember what i said about sneaky <laughs> okay never mind never mind then. <laughs> sorry i'm just confused that's all very good but you'll you'll figure it out okay it's time so i'm going to stop the recording uh, see you next week for everybody so one thing before I stop the recording is that next week is going to be a hybrid class. We're going to have uh, half of the session is on the cluster, but there's also going to be a theoretical part where I'm going to explain the principles of genome assembly.